to look forward to if all we had on this earth is what we see we would be miserable but we have a blessed hope we have the blessed hope of reigning with the Savior in heaven for eternity praise the Lord what a day that's going to be I know as we journey through this life we suffer many trials we suffer many bruises scrapes torn rips battered but no matter what you're facing today be assured he's got you. It's like my husband says when our children were small, he'd say, hold my hand. He'd hold his hand. They'd go to a place that stumble. He'd say, I got you. You're not going to scrape. You're not going to hurt you. You're not going to be utterly destroyed. But I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to hold you. Sheltered in the arms of God. What a blessed hope we have in that. Whatever's coming, Whatever storms approach you, it's going to get darker. We all know that. We've got to find our power on our knees. In His presence is fullness of joy, fullness of strength, fullness of power. Fall before Him to be equipped with the Holy Ghost and fire. Ready, armed to do battle with what the enemy hurls. We are victorious, not in ourselves, only through the power of God. And his promise is in his word. He's not a man that he should lie. And he will keep us. Our faith must be rooted deep, deep. And the only place to get that is down on your knees, sheltered, hiding in the presence of the Almighty God. Under the shadow of the almighty wing, that's where we've got to get there to get our strength. God is my refuge. I've had a few sour notes already. My voice is about gone. I don't know why, but I'm not perfect. But I've come to the conclusion that God takes our imperfections, and he still works a perfect plan. <laughs> that fascinates me. To know that his thoughts toward me are more than the sand amazes me. It just blows my mind. He's got you. No matter where you are, no matter how big the battle, the situation, the circumstances, he's got you. Stay focused and hid in his presence. God is my refuge.
Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Lankford. We'd like to welcome you this Sunday morning to our first studio church service. I certainly hope and I pray that these programs, you being able to come into your home on Sunday mornings and minister to you, will truly be an encouragement and a strength to you in the coming days. Without a doubt, every one of us is going to need strength from the Lord. Regretfully, America our nation, and the world, for the most part, has become very tempestuous, very stormy. Life is becoming more and more uncertain. But the church, the believers, the saints of God, we do have an anchor in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I pray each time we bring to you a Sunday morning worship service that you'll be able to be with us wherein we share the Word of God my wife will be singing and ministering to us in music and in worship. Music and worship is so important. It brings us into the presence of God. If we can just simply get into God's presence, there's absolutely no telling what God can do. I'm convinced today, without a doubt, God can do anything. He said in Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me. He asked the question, is there anything that I cannot do? The truth is God can do anything. Mary questioned Gabriel, how shall this thing be? How shall this child be born in me when I don't even know a man? His response was, with God, all things are possible. And when you incorporate God into your life, your circumstances, and your situations, without a doubt, God can do anything in touching your heart and touching your life. Again, we welcome you today, and I pray that the ministry and my wife singing and music will minister to your heart and minister to your life. But before we begin today, I want to take a moment to pray. I want to pray this 18th day of August that God would touch your heart, God would touch your life, God would touch our president, and God would touch our nation. We certainly need healing 
and America. Let's pray this morning and invoke the blessings of God. Heavenly Father, we love you. We laud, we extol your most righteous, your most holy name. Father, we ask you to touch us today as we gather in this studio. I just pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God would be upon everything that we attempt to do today, Lord, and that it would bring honor and praise and glory to the body of Christ, that the body might be edified and strengthened in this hour. And Lord, we thank you and we bless you for what you're going to do in this service today. Lord, there's just a handful of us in the studio today, but Lord, I know the power, the presence of God is everywhere, for you are omnipresent. Father God, touch our hearts, touch our minds, help us to speak the oracles of God. Help, I pray today, your servants, that the word of truth through song and music and the ministry of your word will go forth in power and in spirit. And I pray that it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which will please you and prosper in the thing whereinto that you send it. Bind us all together. Lord, wherever people are today watching this video, I pray that you'll bind us together that we might be one, even as you and the Father are one. We ask it all in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Again, we welcome you today, our first Sunday morning worship service here in the studio. I pray it will inspire your heart and your life and you'll be encouraged by the ministry of my wife's singing and music and also by the ministry of the Word of God. At this time, Kim, would you come and would you sing for the people? And let's believe God to touch their hearts and touch their lives. Amen. Yes. May I say, sorry about that. May I say that whatever season of life that you're going through with, you must praise him no matter what, in the good, in the bad, in the joyful, in the sad, no matter what, trust him, obey him, and just magnify him and praise him through it all.
sometimes it takes a storm to find a hiding the Lord. Thank you for that, Kim. I certainly hope and I pray today that that song ministered to you immensely. Without a doubt, each of us, sometime in our lives, we need a hiding place from the storm. The great news is Jesus is that hiding place. He is the refuge. David said in Psalms 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength. A present help and trouble. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be speaking to you today about a storm. I want to use for a subject today an opposing storm. I want to turn to Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida that he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came unto them walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. They had just been fed by the Lord Jesus Christ, 5,000 men plus women and children. Yet, while in the Sea of Galilee, and the sea became very tempestuous and very boisterous. They were fearful and afraid that they were going to drown, that they were going to die. But Jesus said they lacked the faith because they just witnessed a dynamic move of God in taking five barley loaves and two small fishes and feeding the multitude. But somehow, quickly their faith faded away. I want to pray this morning. And ask the Lord to add his blessings to the word of God that he might encourage you and strengthen you in this message today. Heavenly Father, again we humbly come before the throne of grace that we might find help in the day of trouble. Lord, I know there are those watching today who they feel like their life is on a tempestuous, boisterous sea. And the briny waves are bursting and breaking asunder their ship, the boat in which they sail. But, Father, you're still the Prince of Peace. You have the power to walk in the storm. You are the peace in the midst of the storm. No matter how troubled we might become or perplexed we might be, no matter how great we may become dismayed, 
You are still the God of all flesh. You are still the creator of heaven and of earth, and you can do anything. Father, I humbly petition you today to strengthen the hearts, the minds of the people, undergird my mind, that I might speak the oracles of God, and that they might go forth in power and in spirit, that you would touch everyone watching today, Father. Bind us all together that we might be one, even as you and the Father are one. And we'll give you the praise for it all, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. And everyone said, Amen. I want to use just for a few minutes today the thought, an opposing storm. An opposing storm. In the natural, winds of disturbance can come from any direction. So it is in our spiritual pilgrimage. Storms can confront us at any moment out of nowhere. Sometimes you're just living your life, minding your business, but all of a sudden, an unbelievable tempest begins to rage against your soul. We never know when that's going to be, neither do we know how it's going to be, but nevertheless, many times this encroaches our lives suddenly, just like that. Out of nowhere, we find our lives distressed, distraught, perplexed, not understanding where we are, why we're in the circumstance or the situation that we're facing. And I want to speak about Job for just a few minutes this morning. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil, living his life, living a tremendous godly life, a life that was pleasing in the eyes of God. Job was a man that was uh, like the psalmist David in the sense he was after. He was pursuing God's heart. But then all of a sudden, one day, God calls a holy convocation in heaven. And the Bible says there in Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. I don't know about you today, but I can sense, I can detect, I note the arrogancy of Satan. I sense his pride and his arrogancy as he says to God, I've been walking to and fro, up and down in the earth. I've been wreaking havoc. I've been destroying homes and families and marriages. I've been destroying relationships among the brethren. I'm wreaking havoc in the earth. I'm creating unfathomable chaos. But then all of a sudden, God responds to Satan's arrogancy and his pride and his spirit of creating chaos and confusion in the earth. And God, out of nowhere, says, Has thou considered my servant Job? Job was on the earth. Satan was around the throne of God. He engaged God. He questioned Job's integrity in God's presence. He didn't say, who are you talking about? Who is this man? I don't know of this man called Job. Who is he? No, that wasn't Satan's response because Satan understood completely who the man of God was, because the Bible begins there again in Job chapter 1, verse 1, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was perfect, upright, one that feared God, and eschewed evil. He stayed away. The word eschewed means to stay away from evil. He did everything he could to stay away from evil. So when God mentions Job's name, Satan doesn't say, who are you speaking of? I've never heard of this man. His response was, Job does not serve you for nothing. You've got this vast hedge about Job. And because of that, Job serves you gleefully, cheerfully, willingly. But pull down the hedge and let me touch his life. He'll curse you to your face. You know the story. 
how that the devil left the presence of God after God pulled down the hedge and he destroyed everything that Job had. He killed his sons, his daughters, his cattle, his oxen, his she-asses, and all of his servants. And all Job had left was him and his wife and his health. Everything that Job had was suddenly taken away from him in a moment of time. Here again, Job has no idea that God has decreed a holy convocation in heaven. Job is not aware of that. Job is living his life, worshiping God, walking in paths of righteousness. But all of a sudden, this storm, this tempest, this raging, bitter, vehement attack from Satan came against the man of God out of nowhere. And he lost everything that he had. But let me tell you something about the devil. No matter how much adversity Satan brings into your life, it is never enough with Satan. Satan is never satisfied until he does what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan will never be satisfied in your life until he has completed and brought utter demise and death and destruction in your life. Job did not fall away from God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Job ran his mantle. He shaved his head. He fell down on the ground. And the Bible says, and he worshiped God. How many of us today, if we lost everything that we have, we could still fall down on the ground, lift up holy hands and worship and magnify the Lord? Admittedly, that would be hard for me to do. But you know, when your affection is set on things above and not on the earth, you can do that if you really have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Job did not buckle. Job did not give in. Even his wife says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Job said, you, you speak like a foolish woman. Shall we not receive good and evil at the hand of the Lord? The Bible says, in all of this, Job sinned not, neither did he charge God foolishly. How many of us would have said something foolish like, I'm going to go get drunk. I'm going to go smoke me some dope. I'm going to smoke some crack. I'm going to get high. I'm going to alleviate my mind of this great distress, this great chaos, this great disaster that has come into my life and come upon me. Job didn't do that. Job continued to walk with God. But again, that wasn't good enough for Satan. He goes back to the throne of God a second time. And he says, God, if you'll just let me touch him physically, all that a man hath will he give for his life. If you'll just let me physically touch Job, I promise you I'll cause him to sin and curse you to your face. And the Bible says in Job chapter 2 verse 6, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Save his life. I preached a message many years ago, man and the hands of Satan. There's not one of you watching this video right now. You don't ever want to be placed literally, physically into the hand of Satan. But God said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. God still put a parameter. He put a a, 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 another line around Job's life. Job didn't know any of this. I mean, the storm that I'm speaking about, the opposing storm, it just came suddenly to the man of God out of nowhere, having perfect health, having tremendous wealth, being blessed. But now in just a moment of time, he loses everything he has regarding his wealth. And now he's about to lose his health. Some of you watching right now, your health is not very well. It's not very good. And because of the distress in your physical body, you get discouraged. 
You become beleaguered. You, you even question God. God, why have you allowed me to come to this place physically in my life? You question God. Why have you let this happen? It's an opposing storm, my friend. And thus Satan says to God, let me touch him skin for skin. All that a man hath will he give for his life. He thought if he put enough pressure on the man of God, Job, that Job would ultimately capitulate. So he struck Job with boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And he would sit and take a piece of broken pottery that no doubt Satan had destroyed in those physical, literal storms that came against Job and his family. And he was scraping the boils with the pottery. But again, in all of this, Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. You see, we, 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 we never know when adversity is going to strike us. We never know where it's coming from, how it's going to happen, how it's going to take place. Thus, we find the words of Solomon in Proverbs 27, verse 1, which says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Job did not understand. Job did not know that in just a moment of time, just that quickly, his life would be, for the most part, totally eradicated. We know Job was not a braggadocious man. Why? Because he was a man after the heart of God. His heart was perfect. A man in the land of us whose name was Job, the man was perfect, upright, one that feared God, and that he shewed evil. And so when good, or when, 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 when good people have bad things to happen to them, our first thought is, God, why? Why have you allowed this? Why are you tolerating? Why are you suffering me to go through this great heartache, this great chaos in my life? Job, now having gotten through these debacles, says in Job chapter 14, verse 1, man, that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Job now began to embrace the brevity of life, the uncertainty of life. He said our lives are, are, are like a, a flower that comes up. The flower is cut, cut off. Many times ladies will cut flowers and bring them in the house and put them in a vase or a vase. And they'll look at the beauty and admire and appreciate God's creation. But in just a matter of days, they begin to wither. They begin to die. They begin to wane. They begin to fall by the wayside. The uncertainty of life, thus boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. All contrary or opposing winds are from your adversary, the devil. God does not create the tempest. God does not create the storm. God does not create the calamitous events in our lives or in America with all of these mass shootings. That's the work of the devil. That's not the hand of God. All God does, though, is pull his hand back and that gives place for the devil to come in and then wreak havoc in our lives. You see, Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is waiting for his opportunity to seize your life, to bring you under his power, bring you under his subjection and wreak havoc in your well-being. And you see these storms, this, this contrary wind that we read about here in the sixth chapter of the book of Mark. This wind was not from Jesus. This storm, this tempest was not from Christ. This was an attempt from Satan to drown them, to destroy them, to separate them from Christ. But let me give you another measure of insight. The reason they were in this storm is, was because they were followers of Jesus Christ. When you're following Jesus Christ, the devil will always seek a way 
a venue, a means, a mode, a method. He's always looking for a way, a place to get into your life and create chaos to no end. The Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles 21 and 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. There's no greater provocateur than Satan. Satan has a way, especially to some of us, uno number one here, he has a way of provoking you. He has a way of doing things and creating situations to get you sidetracked, to get you off of where God is trying to take you. God was blessing David powerfully. I want, I want you to think about the psalmist for just a moment. There's no, we don't have a, a, a detailed record in all of the battles and the wars that David fought regarding the Philistines. But we do know that David defeated the bear. We do know that David defeated the lion. We do know that David fe defeated Goliath. We do know that at many times he defeated the Philistines because they had stolen the Ark of the Covenant and David was able to go back and get it and bring it back to Jerusalem. We never read about David ever being hurt, injured, harmed, stabbed, maimed, hit with a sword or anything, which tells me wherever David was, there was a divine covering and protection about his life. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have storms. You see, God protected David in the sense he preserved David all the way to his death. Satan will come and bring storms into your life, but God will protect you if you'll keep your faith and your focus on Christ. David told his brothers Elab and all of them when Goliath was raging against Israel as a nation, defying the armies of Israel. And David, a little young lad, most believe about 14 years of age, he runs down there to where the battle is because his dad, Jesse, has sent him there to find out how the war's going. And his brothers were critical of David. Oh, you little snot-nosed dude coming down here proud and arrogant. What do you think you're going to do? Well, we know what David did. He said to Goliath, you come to me with the spear and with the sword. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. He told Elip and his brothers and King Saul, he said, let me tell you something, guys. I know what it means to have victory. I've defeated the bear. I've defeated the lion. He no doubt said, look at me. Do you see any claw marks or teeth marks on my body? I defeated them. I killed them. I destroyed them. And this uncircumcised Philistine, he's going to be the same way when I get through with him because God is with me. God is going to help me. God's going to empower me to defeat Goliath. And what does he do? They said, well, you need to put Saul's armor on. And he puts Saul's armor on, and he's clanking, fumbling, stumbling. Why? He's too little for the armor. He said, get this mess off of me. I got God. God is my refuge. God is my strength. God is my fortress. God is the one that will deliver me. And he goes down there with his little sandals on and probably a little tank top or something with his shorts on and begins to whirl that stone. A lot of people think Goliath got killed when David hit him right between the eyes, the only vulnerable place on his body was right between his eyes. But when David hurled that stone and it left the sling, it hit Goliath right between the eyes. But all it did was knock him out. It didn't kill him. It just knocked him out. That's why David went over to where Goliath was, pulled his sword from his sheath, and beheaded the giant and took it by the hair of the head and walked back and said, see here what I've done? God has empowered me to overcome the opposing storm. You never know how the storm is going to come. You don't know how the devil's going to use somebody or something or some circumstance to bring a storm into your life. You never know. But you can wake up Monday morning, just as sure as I'm standing here today on Sunday. You can wake up Monday morning and all of a sudden chaos all of a sudden, disaster. Why? Because Satan has been plotting against your life. Peter, unknowingly, as he's, as he's witnessing 
Jesus going to the cross, and he knows, he knows what's going to happen now, but prior to that, in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, Jesus says to Simon Peter, he said, Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. I, I love to study certain men in the Bible in their lives, and Peter is one of them. I've done a, a lot of detailed studies on his life. Satan will always try to bring a storm. And so when Jesus says to Peter, he said, Simon Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as sweet. Well, what does that mean? Jesus is telling Peter, Satan has literally, physically, spiritually come to me and demanded that I, your Savior, your Lord, your master, your teacher, he's demanded, I give him your soul. Now think about that. A storm, you can't see it, but all of a sudden it suddenly comes up from nowhere. And it's like, what in the world has happened? He said, Peter, Satan has exceedingly demanded, I give him your soul. He said that he might Sift you as wheat. Now, the word sift there in the Greek means to riddle, to, per, to pierce, or to perforate, to literally punch holes into your life. Satan is desirous to punch holes in your life so that not only your, your wealth, but also your health runs out like a leaking vessel and it's all gone suddenly. But here's the key. Jesus said, Peter, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Let me tell you something, folks. Jesus is our intercessor. He is our mediator. He is our attorney at law to stand in the courts of God and defend each and every one of us. And you couldn't have a better representative than Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the halls of judgment when it comes to the courts of God. I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith fell not because you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to falter. But when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Strengthen the brethren. I love that because that tells me as a minister, I have the power in my life through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to strengthen people, to encourage people, to edify people, to lift people up. Why? Because Satan seeks to push people down. That's his method. Put you down, criticize you, find fault, demean, whatever he, he can do. He wants to do that in your life. And see, we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. See, when Satan comes, he doesn't come with joy, gleefulness, encouragement, strength. No. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the Bible said there in Revelation 12 and verse 12, he's come down unto you having great wrath. Great wrath. Don't forget that. Satan will slap you, hinder you, abuse you. He'll do everything he can to destroy your life. Not only does he not only do that, he seeks to conceal the means, the manner, the mode in which he's destroying your life. He conceals what he's doing through deception, through duplicitous uh, deeds and acts. He doesn't want you to see really where this is coming from because he knows if you understand where it's coming from, you can not only deal with it, you can do something about it. Just like Paul, the apostle said, the messenger of Satan buffeted me lest I should be exalted above measure because of the abundance of the revelations that was given unto me, this messenger. Find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. This messenger, buffet. It means to strike violently. But Paul said, I endure this 
I embrace this buffeting. Why? He said that the power and the Spirit of God might rest upon me. Because when I am weak, then I am made strong because God is resting upon me, his power. Sometimes we have to become weak. Sometimes we have to become vulnerable to start trusting God and realizing I can't do this my way. I cannot do this myself. I, I don't have the power to do this in my own. I need the hand, the help of God. There's a verse in the Bible, Psalms 41, verse 11. I love this verse. David said, by this, I know that thou favorest me because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. I've been a Christian over 41 years. I came back to the Lord in 1978. Have I been buffeted? Yes. Have I been discouraged? Yes. Have I been beat down, knocked down, drug around? Yes. But guess what? I'm still standing today. I have faced a lot of opposition and a lot of opposing storms, but I'm still here today. So David said, by this, I know that thou hast favored me because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. Satan can't win over me if I don't allow him to. If I keep my faith in Christ alone, he cannot overcome me. Now, you need to understand something today. When you see these storms and this great tempest, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Now, I, I, I'm like any of you watching today. I, I, I get my feathers ruffled every time I look at Democrats. I get infuriated, I get angry, and I get mad. But I have to understand that's not what I'm fighting. There's something more than that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You are not wrestling against flesh and blood. You say, but flesh and blood, people are hurting me. They're hindering me. That's the devil's power and influence in their lives attacking your life. And don't ever underestimate who the devil can use. He can use a husband. He can use a wife. He can use a son, he can use a daughter, he can use an employer or an employee. Satan, if he can somehow get a place, a position, form a posture in someone's life, he can use that against you. And believe you me, Satan has a lot of emissaries, a lot of cohorts that he can use against the children of God. Everything in your life can be running just like a Singer sewing machine. And all of a sudden, everything is frayed and everything is distorted. Everything becomes out of focus. It just comes up a place of literal disarray. That's what Satan does. And when Satan brings that, just like storms, natural storms bring fear into people's lives. When, when you watch the weather or you hear about a tornado or a hurricane and the weather channel is showing all of these satellite images and you see the ferocity, you see the enormity of the storm and the natural, whether it's flooding waters, you say the water is rising, the water's coming up, the water's going to take me down, the water's going to destroy me. Why does Satan do that? He does that to create fear. <coughs> Satan, just like a natural storm, will create fear in a person's life. Satan will create a circumstance, a situation in your life that you too will be filled with fear. You get up one morning and you find another nodule on your body somewhere. And what is the first words you hear? Cancer. Or you have a little tightness in the chest. What's the first words you hear? Heart attack. Or maybe there's a little dizziness in the head and the first thing you hear is stroke. 
or when the phone rings at midnight or 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, the first thing you hear is death, disaster, calamity. You see, this is the power of Satan. Ephesians 2 and 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. Just like airwaves sending out radio signals, Satan is sending out through the airwaves signals and bursts of fear. He sends out bursts of fear. Why? He wants to bring fear into your life because fear is of the devil and fear paralyzes us. Fear is a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. The Bible said in 1 John 4 and 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Now watch this, because fear hath torment. Don't ever underestimate Satan's desire to torment you. He wants to torment you in, in some capacity. Why? Fear will paralyze you. Fear will incapacitate you. Fear will stop you. There are so many phobias in the world, all types of phobias. The Greek word is phobos. It means fear, anxiety. So many people regretfully today are taking psychotropic drugs. Why? Because of fear. They don't want to go out of the house. They don't want to drive. They don't want to be around people. They're afraid to get into buildings. Something might bad happen. That's the devil. That's not God. God does not do that to his people. Listen to the psalmist David in Psalms 23:4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice how David responded to fear. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Reading that many years ago, I realized something. To have a shadow, you got to have light. To have shadow, you must have light. That means you're in the light for the shadow to be cast. The shadow is, is, is the similitude, a, a, a sense of the devil trying to bring fear. You've heard it said, people are afraid of their shadow. Afraid of their shadow. Great fear. Anxiety. Trepidation. He said, I'll fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. I remember when Lenton was a little boy, about five or six years old. He was always bragging. I don't know where he got that from, but he bragged a lot. And so one night, it was about 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and then our driveway was over 400-some feet long out to the road to where the, the mailbox was and the, the uh, newspaper box. He's bragging about how big, how tough he was. He wasn't afraid of anything. It's about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and I said, Linton, yeah, go out there and get the newspaper. He said, no. I said, son, I thought you was big and bold and brave. He said, yeah, but it's dark out there. <laughs> he didn't want to go. He didn't want to walk down that driveway by himself in the dark. Fear. People have such fear in their lives today, and that fear comes from the devil. It doesn't come from God. The Bible said in I, uh, excuse me, Psalms 56, verse 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. David did not deny that sometimes he did not have fear. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. When he stood before Goliath, he had no fear. I want to take you down, Goliath. I'm going to bring you down. But there are times when our faith is not so strong. There are times when our faith wanes or our faith wavers or, or we're just not where we need to be in Christ. And then we become afraid. But David said, what time I am afraid? I will trust in thee. David said in Psalms 27 verse 1, the Lord is my life and my strength. Whom shall I fear or what shall I be afraid of? He's, you see here, here's a man that's talking bold because he said God is my Life, God is my salvation, God is my strength. 
Whom shall I fear or what shall I be afraid? But then you get to Psalms 56. He says, what time I'm afraid. I will trust in thee. I love Psalms 115 verses 12 and 13. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Your fear should not be with the devil. Your fear should be toward God. Go back to Job 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was perfect, upright, one that feared God, and he shewed evil. Your fear is not to be to the devil. Your fear is to be to God, godly fear, godly reverence. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Fear will paralyze people because they don't have faith in God. The disciples here in our scripture text in Mark chapter 6, they let fear seize their life. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Did you know the devil wants to take away the soundness of your mind. He, he wants you to believe that your, your mind is waning and that fear is being instilled in your mind and that you're uncertain about, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go here? Should I go there? Does God still love me? Has God left me? Has God abandoned me? These are all the things the devil brings into the Christian's mind. Constantly. Sometimes if you could see somebody's mind, it's like, 50 gears turning and spending, and there's no oil there to lubricate, to keep down the heat of friction. And there, if you could see their mind, it would be red hot, like metal gears with no oil, red, getting ready to seize up and quit functioning. That is exactly what fear does to people when it ultimately paralyzes them and they become completely, totally devastated and become inept. That is what Satan does. Seize the mind, shut them down, cause them to have a nervous wreck, cause them to be full of, full of so much fear that they can't even function, they can't even do what they need to do. It's sad, but it's reality. In closing today, I want to encourage you how to negate fear. How, how, how can I negate fear? How can I negate the anxiety? Through praise and worship. Those are the two things that negate fear is praise and worship. Why? Because ultimately faith destroys fear and fear destroys faith. How do I have the faith that I need? You praise God and you worship God. So many times, and we're all guilty of it, when distress of life overwhelms us, we fail to pray, we fail to praise, we fail to worship Oh, we'll get on the phone and call somebody and pour out our heart. We'll get to feeling sorry for ourselves and regretfully some even contemplate suicide. We get so beleaguered and so discouraged, we say, you know what, I'm just going to quit. I'm tired of fighting. No, that's not the answer. Praise and worship. Remember, Job fell down on the ground Rent his mantle, shaved his head, and worshiped God. Worshiped God. He praised and he worshiped God. I don't know what he was saying, but he was probably saying something like this. Though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. 
I'm going to extol, I'm going to laud, I'm going to magnify your name. Doesn't matter what my wife says. Doesn't matter what my husband says. Doesn't matter what my children say. I'm going to keep on keeping on because I know in the end, if I hold on to my faith in you, I'll hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Psalms 25 and verse 23. I love that verse. The reason I love that verse, he didn't say you were faithful over everything. He said thou hast been faithful over a few things. And because you've been faithful over a few things, he says I'm going to make you ruler over many things. That's the only time you see that in the Bible. It's always few there be that find it, but many go into the way of destruction. But he says because you've been faithful over a few things, I'm now going to make you ruler over many things. Psalms 29 verse 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his holy name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord. Let the, the spirit of grace come over you and upon you and in your heart and your life and magnify the Lord. If you'll read the 13th chapter of the book of Psalms, David goes into a a state of utter demise. He says, Lord, how long shall I sleep the sleep of death? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Sorrow in my heart daily. But Psalms 13 only has six verses. Listen to what verse 6 says. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. He starts off those first five verses, negative, 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 negative. But he says, but I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. You see, God does never, does never leave us. He, he never abandons us. He never forsakes us. It's we who forsake him. It's we who abandon him. Psalms 34 verse 1 says, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And furthermore, if you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you should be worshiping him and thanking him and magnifying him. Psalms 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. How do we say so? By praise and by worship. Stephen, I want you to cue up Kim's song again. and I want her to sing that again today before we leave here. Because sometimes it does take a storm. The Bible says in Psalms 150, verse 6, Psalms 150, verse 6, Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord. If you're watching this video, this 18th day of August, you've got breath. You know, when I ride down the road and I see a, a little bird on a tree limb or a fence post, he's just chirping away. You know what he's doing? He's praising God. When that little calf runs around the pasture with its tail high in the air, they're just praising God and thanking God for his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. Sometimes it does take a storm. But the storm is not there to destroy you. The storm is there to increase your faith. When the opposing storm comes, don't allow, don't allow the storm to knock you down, but put your face in the head of that wind and say, devil, you may come to me with a storm like Goliath with a spear with a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. I'm going through this storm because I know on the other side there is peace, placidity, tranquility, a calm, just like it was before the storm. The calm will return, folks. But you have to trust God in spite of the storm, in spite of the tempest 
and the raging waves and the briny waves. You have to keep trusting God. If you'll do so, God will bless your heart and God will bring you through the storm. If you'll read this account in the book of John, when Jesus got in the boat, the Bible said they were at the land where they were going. Now, how he got it there like that, I don't know. He's God and do anything. But when he got in the boat, they found themselves docked at the shore. No more on the sea. No more on the briny waves, the tempestuous winds, storm. They were, at, they were at their haven of rest because Jesus stepped into the bow of the ship and said, Peace, be still. Listen as Kim sings this song again for us today. Put your mind on the Lord and let him minister to your heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We can turn to you, Lord. When your waters are so troubled, you don't think you count at all. Waves may seem like mountains when your boat is oh so small. But somewhere past the clouds waits a new day to begin. Sometimes it takes a storm to calm your storm within. Sometimes it takes I 
I've found my hiding place. Dear Lord, I thank you for my storms. For you are my hiding No greater place to be hidden than to be hid in Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for tuning in, being with us today in our first church service in our studio. We've been anticipating doing this for quite some time. But like everything, it takes time to get everything arranged that we can do what we want to do for the Lord. We'll probably be trying to do this at least twice a month. So go ahead and kind of slate that Sunday in your time schedule. We'll be giving updates throughout the week through our radio programming and our YouTube updates, our YouTube uh, programming. We'll let you know the Sundays that we're going to come into the studio and have a type of a church service. And I'll announce prior to that, of course, when we're going to have communion so many people want to partake communion. I'll give you a heads up. You can get your elements and be prepared to partake in the Lord's Supper in communion before we do that. But I'll give you a heads up, let you know ahead of time when we're going to do that. Let me say today, thank you for your love. Thank you for your support for the voice of evangelism. You're the means, the method that God uses to help us to continue to carry the gospel of Christ. We work entirely here, my wife, myself, Jasmine and Stephen, we all work here to minister to you. Some, sometimes like any other job or task, it becomes laborious, it becomes arduous. There's a lot to do. You just don't walk in here in five minutes and put on a program like this and have church. There's a lot of things that goes into preparing for this. I'm certain most of you understand that completely and totally. Uh, just like in, just like a regular church service. So thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. I know your prayers help us. We couldn't sustain the adversity that we sustain and overcome weekly unless it were through, were through your prayers and praying for the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to give us strength and grace. Before I leave today, I want to pray for you again. I know many of you are beleaguered. Some are even discouraged. Maybe today the message that I brought forth, maybe the song that Kim sang was just what you needed to hear today to lighten your load a little bit, to encourage, to strengthen your heart, to strengthen your life. I know that God will help you. He helps everyone who will trust him. And lean upon him. David said in Psalms chapter 7 verse 1, In thee, O Lord God, do I put my trust. It is in you, Lord, we put our trust. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come into people's homes today to share the word of God and ministry of song and of music and of worship. Thank you for the grace of God that you've shown each and every one of us how that we've been able to overcome the enemy, how we've been able to live lives of victory, how you have sustained us in spite of the enemy's opposition. Father, I pray today for every home that is struggling. I pray for those who may be in a time of bereavement, of deep brokenness, contrition, and sorrow. I pray that you will comfort them, you will strengthen them, I pray for those today, Lord God, who the devil has said you have forgotten them, you have abandoned them, and they feel as though they're on the backside of the desert. But Lord, that's where Moses encountered the burning bush on the backside of the desert because you're everywhere, anywhere, any place, any time, you're there in behalf of your people. Bless us now. Bless the voice of evangelism. Give us tens of thousands of souls in these last days, Lord, help us to reach the lost at any cost, Father God, I pray. Father, I bless 
those who bless this ministry. I bless them in the name of Jesus, the Lord's Christ, those who stand with us and financially give us aid and support. God, I ask your blessings specifically upon the co-laborers in the vineyard you have planted us. Bless them. Bless their businesses, their homes, and their families. Bless everything that their hands touch, Father. I'll give you the praise for it all. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. May the Lord God of Abraham watch over you, and may he forever order your steps in his most holy word. Again, we'll give you an update the next time we're going to come into the studio and have a live worship service for you. God bless you until next time. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.